Okay, good evening. I'd like to call the public hearing for the Planning and Zoning Commission for Tuesday, April 13th, 2021 to order. Uh, our first item is, well, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance first. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, and if the Secretary could do the public notice, please. Okay, Town of South Windsor, Planning and Zone, Zoning Commission, Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Uh, 7 p.m. to be published in Journal Inquire on Thursday, April 1st and Thursday, April 8th. Are the public hearing of the meeting? Online meeting starts at 7. Please call the Planning Department 860-644-2511, extension 2530. To view this meeting, please tune into Channel 16 if your provider is Cox Cable or Channel 6082 if your provider is Frontier or go to Gmedia dot s-w-a-g-i-t dot com forward slash live webex webex conference call in number is 855-925-2801 the meeting code is 6423 and the public hearing hearing webex conference online meeting 7 p.m the public is welcome to email comments to planning zoning comments at southwindsor dash ct dot gov or to call in through the above reference web and call in number. And that's it. So number one, PZC sponsor text amendment, electric vehicle charging supply equipment zoning text amendment continued from March 23rd, 21. And number two, application 21-11P, REESG, New Cove, South Windsor, LLC, request for zone change from general commercial zone, GC, to Sullivan, Avenue mixed use development overlay zone SAMUD of 19 plus or minus acres and general development plan of development for, for the renovation of 60,740 square foot of commercial space and the development of 125 apartment units on property known as Sullivan Avenue Plaza located at 959, 1017, and 1079 Sullivan Avenue GZ zone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to remind the public this meeting is being live streamed through a WebEx conference call on the town website, as well as local channels and will be operating under the following procedures. The session is being audio recorded and video recorded to ensure sound quality. The default rule for this meeting is that everyone will remain on mute. Commissioners and staff will generally remain on mute, except when speaking or voting and will generally be keeping video of themselves on throughout the meeting. Applicants should feel free to leave their video on or off. However, they will be asked to turn video on uh, when speaking. The public can provide public comments by email and or phone. The email address and phone number uh, and the meeting code can be found on the front of the agenda. During public meetings, all the normal rules, including stating and now spelling your name still apply. If you're speaking at this meeting and have an exhibit to submit to the commission, which has not been distributed in advance of the meeting with the rest of the materials, please indicate that you wish to submit an exhibit. You will need to hold it up to the camera so that the commission and all members of the public may review it. In addition, you'll be required to email the exhibit or take a photograph of it and email it to planning zoning comments at southwindsor.org and it will be included in the permanent records of the commission. Members of the public may only speak during public participation for an item not on the agenda and during the public hearing comment period. Lastly, a reminder to the public on the phone to press star three to indicate that you want to speak and the pound sign to get back to the main menu. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping tonight. Uh, we do have a number of commissioners that are absent. 
so um, we will be sitting uh, Commissioner McGuire for Commissioner Greer. Uh, I think um, our other two alternates are not here tonight, uh, so um, they won't be joining us. Okay. Um, our first item and uh, our order of business tonight will be first to hear from our applicant, then we will hear from town staff, then we'll, we will hear from members of the public, and letters will be read, emails will be read, and then we will hear from commissioners. So at this time, um, I guess I will open it up to Michelle for the PCC sponsored tax amendment for the EV charging supply equipment. Uh, at this time, I have no further comments from the last meeting. We did hold it open and we do have one public comment that has been submitted uh, to be read into the record. Okay. Um, Steve, did you have anything additional? Commissioner Wagner? Um, well, there is a letter that uh, or an email that I received, which I did uh, forward to Michelle, and she gave you all copies of it. But uh, I think it would be appropriate to read it, uh, and then I could comment on some of the things it says. Okay. Uh, so this is this is from Jared Lewis. Uh, Hi, Steve. My name is Jared Lewis. I was listening to your presentation to the P and Z Commission. I was also listening in as Stephen Lewis presented the same information to the EDC. Uh, which is the Economic Development Commission. Uh, my wife, Mindy, is on that committee. I'm not sure you are the person to direct my comment toward, but you seem to be a good starting point. Your presentation really caught my attention. I think the town should be 100% behind this plan. In fact, I was a bit disheartened to hear one member of the EDC using language like regular vehicles when referring to gas-powered engines. That language, while possibly understandable, shows a lack of foresight. They're envisioning EVs on the road, looking to charge while their drivers uh, go shopping. I envision something much different. If we continue to think of EVs as a niche market rather than the future of the entire car market, then we will miss the bus. With that in mind, I am curious if there are plans regarding incentivizing the considerable commercial truck users in our town to electrify their fleets. Uh, because of proximity to 84 and 91, we as a town have attracted a large number of transportation and warehouse companies operating with loud and polluting diesel trucks. Yet when I look online, I find news releases and videos from manufacturing showing off their EV trucks. This is likely outside the scope of the current plans, but it, wouldn't it be great to be at the forefront of that evolution? In that same vein, what about the garbage truck and school bus fleets? I know these are operated by private companies, but are there ways that town could help incentivize these transactions? I hope I'm not wrong, but I think we're on the cusp of sea change. Yes, it will take years, but why wait for others to take the lead regard Jared Lewis? I thought I would comment on a couple of his comments. Um, yeah, we referred to uh, regular vehicles, gas powered vehicles as uh, ice or internal combustion engine vehicles uh, would be a better language um, and then we don't right now uh, you know the energy committee is involved in a number of uh, efforts to uh, incentivize electric vehicle uh, charging stations around town but we haven't approached either the school bus or uh, uh, garbage truck people i would say that one of our uh, Early options may be for the town to get an electric uh, dump truck. And we are looking at uh, what will turn out to be a long-term plan to uh, hopefully electrify uh, the town's fleet, including uh, some of the smaller uh, gas powered items uh, like uh, mowers and so on. Uh, all of that, uh, that's the way for these vehicles, the, you know, the current fleet to reach the point at which they're going to be replaced. But uh, the Energy Committee, uh, and in particular, a subcommittee led by uh, Jeff Doolittle, um, are, uh, are looking at that. Um, 
so yeah, EV trucks are actually uh, a possibility for this town. Other than that, I don't have anything to add. Other, I would point out that we talked about last time uh, in the draft, uh, there was some language um, that required all streetlights to have uh, a level one chargers, which is basically a 120 volt plug. Uh, we decided to remove that. Um, I think that should be added as a permissible option um, in uh, section 11.8.3 and uh, without uh, requiring that that space be exclusively uh, limited to electric vehicles. If uh, anyone wants to put a, a plug on a street light and allow people to use it, um, there are a lot of complications if they want to be paid for the electricity. So I would say it's permitted uh, and not um, not um, limiting the space for electric vehicles. The other change that we made or talked about was uh, there was a requirement that uh, uh, there's an allowance in 11.8.3 um, that uh, allows in uh, paragraph eight that allows electronic displays, including advertising, et cetera. Um, and we provided that such displays are not visible from roadways. I think we ought to make that visible from public roadways, uh, just to make sure that uh, if somebody on an internal roadway in a site like Evergreen Walk, um, that's their business, whether they want the advertising to be visible. Those are the only two changes relative to the draft we started with. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up to commissioners. Um, we might as well just go down the line. Um, and when I call your name, I'm just asking if you have any changes or comments regarding the previously discussed regulation uh, draft. So, Commissioner Von Zandi. No new comments. It was excellent, excellent presentation. And Oha really agree to everything Steve and uh, you guys are, uh, are proposing. Okay, Commissioner Dexter. No changes, no comments. Okay, Commissioner Foley. Uh, no changes, no comments to the text, but I would like to make comment on uh, what Steve was talking about with the town vehicles. Um, you know, they, they've leased these new GMC Acadias for inspectors and town employees they usually run around with just one person in the vehicle i i'm 100 percent with steve as far as uh, there's no need for these ice vehicles when we have the opportunity to take the forefront and go to electric so steve i hope you have a open line of communication up to the big town hall to see if we can get that moving along besides just the dump truck there's a fleet of brand new acadias up there that I'd like to see electric, so thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Commissioner McGuire? Uh, no changes. Um, I uh, just support uh, being in the forefront of this uh, more efficient, more energy efficient movement. I think it's great, and I think it shows that we have a lot of foresight into uh, into what's coming, you know, to anticipate this uh, more energy efficiency, so I think it's great. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, where in the proposed regulations do we discuss uh, renovation projects? I, Let I me uh, find it. That. Yeah. I believe it's under the commercial. It's actually um, section 6.4.10. Okay. We talk about uh, projects with additions, square footage, as well as parking counts. Okay, and where where did we leave it as far as um, if somebody comes in and wants to renovate a building? Well, six four ten alpha um, gives the specific requirements. It kicks in at 10,000 square foot addition, Bart. Okay. Um, I still have a problem with that because 
then we're missing out on any project that comes in that isn't adding space, which is going to probably be 90% of the turnover. Uh, well, there so is this, the, the last um, section of that, the last uh, phrase says, or a significant change in use resulting in rehabilitation of existing property with 50 or more parking spaces. So there's three criteria there, the increase of 10,000 square feet, the adding of 50 spaces, or the significant change in use. Okay, but if a manufacturer comes in to fill a building that's currently used for manufacturing, uh, it doesn't sound like there's any obligation for them to uh, switch to EV or add EV, not switch to. No, and quite frankly, they wouldn't be in front of the commission if it was a like use going into an existing site plan. Uh, maybe that's something that could come about through an abatement procedure or something like that, um, if that were the case. In other words, you probably wouldn't even see a site plan if it's like type use. It doesn't necessarily get in front of the commission. Yep. But if these are the regulations, uh, they would still have to abide by the regulations. It wouldn't necessarily have to come to the commission, correct? If, if we added, if we eliminated the 10,000 square feet, then it, to me, they would have to go by the regulations, even though it doesn't come in front of the commission, correct? Well, it's kind of like you're subject to the regulations at the time of your approval. So you got an approval in place, right? And if you're, nothing's changing on the site other than the occupant, if the use is staying the same, the parking's staying the same, I'm not sure um, how you would compel them to add EV chargers if they're not doing any upgrades. Uh, to be honest, um, unless they're looking for something from us, like a sign permit or something like that, that you know, if you're a, a manufacturer and you're moving into an existing space, we don't always know about that. Right. The state uh, uses the term major renovation. Uh, and again, I don't know how we're aware of that. Um, when we discussed this um, uh, with Michelle and others, we were concerned about uh, disincentivizing the restoration of blighted spaces. So. Uh, that's why that got in there. Um, but again, uh, I think it's up to the commission whether they, you know, let's say you have a blighted building that's going to take a major renovation to even make it usable. Um, um, we want to change the requirement, you know, would that, would we want that building to go ahead and, uh, you know, while they're out there fixing up their parking lot along with their blighted building, shouldn't they be putting EV in? I think that's what, um, um, Chairman Prasakonis is talking about. So we could, you know, we could change that to major renovation, but we have to decide what we mean by that. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it it's seldom that we have an application that the original build out didn't maximize the amount of impervious coverage for the lot. Uh, a lot of times, uh, like there's a 65% uh, requirement or allotment and the uh, developer is at 64% or 62%. And um, I just don't see many 10,000 square foot uh, additions to existing buildings. Um, what, if, what if we said instead of adding 50 parking spaces, we said where um, the parking lot is, is being refurbished or words to that effect? I mean, it's really the case of if they're out there refurbishing the parking lot, uh, 
That's where all the expenses. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Steve. I I would be good with that. I just want to see something that moves it forward, not status quo. You know. Um, do you have suggestions on wording? Well, Kevin has his hand up. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. I just want to. Uh, Michelle had said something um, in regards to if there is an abatement. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, a uh, a tax break from the town that could we could we mandate that michelle to say you know if the some kind of wording that if they're if they are getting a tax break from the town that they would have to in turn support this you know i don't think you can condition it on someone else's uh, action. I mean, you could certainly write a letter to the town council and request that they uh, look at having that as part of plans that are coming forward. Um, there are times where abatements are given where you're not seeing the site plan. Uh, it's not that often that that happens, but it can happen. We could put that as a criteria, though. If you are to receive a tax abatement, then... Um... I, I honestly don't know if that would be a legal condition or not. I'd be glad to check on it and let you know if we could do that. Yeah, well, I don't do. want to hold anything off. I mean, I, I'm in favor of what Steve's got, you know, all the work he's done here. I'm just looking at trying to help move it forward any way we can. But um, I just what, think, what the I energy think. committee can do, we're, we're a subcommittee of the town council. What we can do is go to the council and say, um, uh, you know, this is a, a tax abatements are your bailiwick. Uh, uh, we should ask you to. Uh, uh, require this uh, or change the percentage of the tax abatement based on, you know, are they putting solar on the roof? Are they putting uh, electric vehicle charging in? Um, so yeah. we could do a number of energy related requirements associated with getting tax abatements. And I think that's more of the council's job in, in, the, in that case. Okay. No, I agree, Steve. I just, I'm looking at ways to help move this along. And if with the help of the town council, through the abatement process that, you know, we're investing in you, you got to invest back in, you know, in energy. So, so let me suggest the following uh, change of wording uh, on paragraph 6.4.10 alpha, uh, replace expansion of 50 parking spaces or significant, or replace expansion of, of 50 parking spaces with, uh, refurbishment or expansion of parking spaces. Can we delete the increase of 10,000 square feet? Uh, that's a separate, I guess I'd like to hear people's opinion uh, there. Um, personally, I'd be happy to do that. Again, the concern is uh, that we uh, might disincentivize uh, fixing up a blighted uh, building. I have real concern with that because honestly, we don't get told when people are refurbishing their parking lots. I mean, we will turn around and it'll be done. You know, if they're, if they're just black topping it over or whatever, there's really no reason they have to come in for any kind of permitting. So it's, it's a very, um, one that I think would be applied unfairly, to be honest with you, because I don't think we would know about majority. I agree with Michelle on that. If somebody is doing a renovation, you know, a mill and uh, a mill and grind and repave, and you know they they put money aside each year for maintenance of their property, they and they all their all their intent is to do is to pave their parking lot. This might be a little bit extreme at that point. I think it'd be really good if through the energy committee we could come up with some kind of um, incentive program. You know. Um, even revolving loan fund or something to try to encourage businesses to do it, not so much, you know, for the ones that aren't through the regulations, some kind of program in town to try to encourage it. What if we took the numbers out of that paragraph and it just said an increase of square feet, an increase of floor space, or an expansion of parking spaces? That means they're coming in to see you, right, Michelle? Yes, they are. If we take the numbers out, uh, at least we'd catch those cases. 
Okay, but then you you still got the small business and the ten. Uh, did we say ten under ten spaces? I don't see that in this language. But. It's, it's under fifteen. It's in your chart right below, Barb. Okay. Okay. You know, if if you do that kind of wording in a situation where someone comes in and they're putting on a thousand square feet and doing minor things, there is a provision here. Deferred. Yeah, there's an app. There is a, a paragraph under uh, uh, under par, under alpha. The applicant the applicant may request a modifier and or defer the number of EV charging spaces required based on site conditions at the time of application. So they can come in and plead their case. Uh, regardless of what the uh, previous paragraph says. So that allows room for some judgment and uh, fairness in treating people. Okay, so hypothetically, we have a, a 5,000 square foot building and they come in and want to do a 5,000 square foot addition. Do they meet this criteria and need to do the EV parking? Yeah, again, that's such a small building, they probably uh, fall under the one to 15 required spaces, but, um, and I'm not sure I got that right, but. Uh, with, yeah, the last, with the last wording Steve gave us, Bart, yes, it would have to meet it, because we're talking about any property that's being refurbished or being expanded. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, parking expansion I'm, or building expansion. Okay, then I'm in favor of that um uh, so let me read the... okay let's listen to others first yeah uh do the other commissioners support that commissioner bonzani yeah definitely and i i think that the uh like steve was saying the number of parking spaces is going to go a long way to go you know decide what they do one to you know one to 15 is definitely gonna be a small business and over 15 probably be a little bigger and i think that would be um definitely in the in the plans for uh for them going for it but yeah i definitely uh, agree with the uh, new language okay thank you commissioner dexter same as frank just said yes um i support those subtle changes okay commissioner foley support the changes okay and commissioner mcguire uh, yes i would support that Okay. Okay, Steve, did you have more to add or? I was just gonna give the precise wording there. Uh, the current wording is an increase of 10,000 square feet of floor space, comma, expansion of 50 parking spaces, um, or a significant change in, result, in use resulting rehabilitation of existing property with 50 or more parking spaces. Uh, I would change that to read an increase of floor space, expansion of parking spaces, or a significant change in use resulting in real, real rehabilitation of existing property with 50 or more parking spaces. I left the 50 in the last sentence. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, if anybody is not, please speak up. Okay, great. So at this point, um, is there any other public discussion we need to do? Uh, Chairman, um, I think we have two people on the line that have their hands up. We're not quite sure if they want to speak on this for the next application, but I, I think we should probably let them in at some point. Okay. Yeah, if we could do that, Mike. Okay. Oh, hi, this is Bill Jodas, and I was going to speak on the uh, Geisler's Plaza okay, application. Then. Uh, we'll be taking that up a little later. Yes. Okay. That's thank fine. You. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Excuse me. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, 
This is Mark Kazakowski, 863 Park Street. Um, I want to make comments on the proposed uh, amendments for the EV uh, stations. Um, I apologize oh. for uh, missing the opening of the public. Um, lost track of the agendas, but I wish to make some comments tonight. Um, I first want to commend the commission for uh, being forward thinking with these regulations as we work to be a more sustainable community. But I also want to take this opportunity to address some concerns and deficiencies in these regulations. First, looking through an economic development lens, uh, the additional minimum EV requirements for new developments um, and um, additional developments, you know, in light of the amendments that you just made, um, the requirements uh, seem a lot. Um, I don't know what the right number of stations or EV ready stations there should be, but through zoning, the proposal is increasing the cost of de development without providing any benefit to the business locating there. This proposal adds a cost burden to developers. And as we know, capital is fluid and this can potentially push new development elsewhere. Secondly, um, I have concerns about allowing EV parking lots as primary uses in all the proposed zones, um, but especially in the rural residential zone. I understand that they would be special exception uses, which gives the commission some ability to condition the use, but the proposal lacks criteria and standards for evaluating special exception requests. The proposal has no landscaping or screening requirements. Um, there is no coverage limits, no parking setbacks, um, uh, no different minimum requirements for EV stations in these commercial parking lots um, as a primary use. And, uh, um, and these kinds of uh, paved lots um, without a business there can often lend themselves to becoming parking for other commercial vehicles, trailers, and storage of materials. So there's going to be a uh, kind of a constant maintenance or uh, management of these um, by, by, city, by town staff. Um, the lack of standards and these common criteria um, can have detrimental impacts on a residential neighborhoods in the rural residential zone. The RR zone does have some large lots along our major roads, um, but the zone also has residential subdivisions um, with uh, lots on cul-de-sacs. Um, there are many building lots in the zone that would be inappropriate for a commercial parking lot like this, and the commission would have a tough time either in special exception review or in an appeal uh, defending a denial of the proposal. Uh, so thank you for uh, taking my comments. And we appreciate you sharing them with us. Um, so I believe you are asking that we not allow them in the RR zone, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that, that um, makes sense to me, Steve. I'm not sure uh, how you feel about that. I, I, I'll uh, defer to Michelle, but I, I think the idea was that uh, um, our special exception criteria would protect us. Uh, and uh, there are a few lots in the RR zones uh, uh, where, you know, we might have a uh, um, commuter uh, a lot or something where this would be appropriate. Although the commuter lot on Ellington Road is actually on uh, state property. Uh, so I don't know whether there really are opportunities to uh, put one of these into any of the RR zones. So I guess I would ask Michelle what she knows about that. And, and um, we are, by the way, in case people are trying to figure out what we're talking about, we're talking about table 311A uh, under commercial uses. I can um, certainly see some of the concerns um, that were expressed. I think I would argue that we would be applying the same landscaping standards and setback requirements that we do for current parking lots. So I think there are some standards that would have to be applied to it. But um, I can certainly see not allowing them in residential zones to start out with and see how things evolve. Um, it's certainly something you could add in later on if there were a need or uh, someone really came in looking for it. So, I mean, I could certainly see not allowing it, but but I think you do have some standards that would um, apply if you do permit them, for, for example, in the commercial zone as a single use. 
you do run into impervious coverage issues in the residential zone and things like that. So it's probably without more tweaking, not really um, viable. Or... You know, I'd, I would be happy um, taking that out. Um, and uh, if an applicant comes in and they're uh, really anxious to do that, they can apply for a zone change and we can carefully, we can consider that a little more carefully at the time. Yeah, and it's, it's not unheard of if we excluded residential zones. Um, if, like you say, an applicant comes in the future, uh, we can always adjust our regulations through the process. But um, I would be happy uh, taking that out. Uh, okay. And uh, an applicant comes in and they're really um, Michelle, did you get the other um, suggestions? Uh, uh, the other concern I think was were expressed were the economic development impact on businesses and the cost of this. And this is something that I believe every other town is going to be addressing. Um, Yeah, there's going to be some some cost involved in it, uh, but that's the future. Um, I I don't know how to. I I think we've got some criteria in there to cushion it somewhat, and it's really a minimal impact. I don't think the speaker uh, knows that. We're really looking at, uh, for most businesses, or um, looking at for their employees. Um, but I guess some of the um, bigger lots would have to address it when they're coming in. And I, th I think they're ready to address it from the applicants that we've uh, mentioned it to so far. Let me just add that we do have, um, first of all, for multi-use developments, multi-unit uh, housing developments, um, it actually makes the site more attractive to renters. Uh, and then the fact that we're not requiring the actual charging equipment means they're basically getting about a factor of four reduction in the cost of the underground wiring and uh, so forth if they do it while they're uh, building the site rather than waiting until later when they have to tear up an existing entrench an existing uh, parking lot. So, I mean, the incentive is they get ahead of the game and we also reduce the number of required parking spaces um, from by uh, allowing them to do this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask the secretaries, were there any letters uh, addressing this and all those letters that you have? No, it's just the letter that Steve read was the only one for the EV uh, application. Okay. And I'll ask Mike again, is there anybody else on the line with their hand up? Okay, great. Um, so uh, how's the rest of the commission feel about excluding the um, charging stations, um, I believe it's the commercial charging stations from the residential zones. We're, is everybody good with that? I'll, I'll go opposite order. Elizabeth, Commissioner McGuire? Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Foley? Sounds good. Commissioner Dexter? Agree. Commissioner Bonzani? Yep, definitely agree. And Steve, you're fine with it, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, is there anything else to discuss on this? Michelle, is there any reason to leave the public hearing open?
Michelle there? Yeah, you didn't hear me? No, hear I me? did. I'm sorry, no, not at this time. I think oh, you can yeah. close it. <laughs> okay. Commissioner, is there any reason to keep the public hearing open? No. No? Okay. Then uh, we will close the public hearing at 742, and we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which is too many papers. Okay, our next item is our application 21-11P. Do we have uh, someone here to uh, represent the application for REESG Nuco South Windsor LLC? I think Michael will be starting to let folks in. Okay. Okay. Hey, Butter? Yes. I just want to remind you that I have to leave like at 8, 15, 8, 20 to go pick up mom and dad. So I know yep. I didn't think that was going to take 15 minutes for that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That was what time you leaving? Like 8, 20? Early. 8, They're going to be in at 8, 41. I'm not like making them wait. So probably 8, 20 and I'll fly there. Okay. Thanks. Just maybe make note of it for the secretary when you... I wish we could do the reading. Can we do? Can we read the letters now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Pasaconis and members of the commission. I'm Peter Demalley, representing the applicant. Well, I'm president of Design Professionals offices here in South Windsor, and incidentally, just for uh, a little anecdote. Uh, this is this month observes our 35th anniversary of being starting the business right here in South Windsor. We remained the entire time. So I'd like to get going with our application. In January of last year, the commission adopted that's you adopted uh, the new Sullivan Avenue mixed use development regulations and overlay zone, allowing for us to apply tonight for a zone change to that overlay zone and for a general plan of development, which is basically an advanced conceptual plan. Uh, or preliminary engineering plan. At the zoning hearings, the zoning text uh, amendments received broad-based community support. And if you recall, it was a standing room only crowd. Um, almost everyone was uh, definitely in support of it. Um, with very few exceptions. Before I get into the meat of our presentation, I'd like to uh, introduce our team. Uh, first is my client, Greg Nanny of REESG Nuco South Windsor LLC. Long one, uh, the applicant. Uh, Greg's on right now with us, as I can see. Uh, somewhere on here. Hopefully he's on. Okay. Uh, second person is Bob Rybick. He's the CEO of the Geisler Supermarket chain, uh, and they are proposed to be the primary commercial tenant uh, of this complex, and they are the primary and one and only tenant at this time. Uh, Third person is Benjamin Wheeler. He's our director of operations here and a, a professional landscape architect in the state of Connecticut of uh, design professionals. Uh, he's in the building with me tonight. Uh, also uh, with us from New Jersey is Timothy Wentz of Gate 17 Architecture out of Wall, New Jersey, uh, who is the architect for the residential community component, although he's been working with our commercial architect and I'll introduce him I'll introduce in a moment. Also, uh, member of the team. So we have two architects who've been working together, and that's David Wagner of Shadler Selnow Associates of Farmington, Connecticut, uh, who is the architect for the commercial component. Uh, and then uh, two other members of our design team uh, are Kwesi Brown of SLR International in Cheshire. Uh, you might have known them as Mylon and McBroom. They're now part of SLR International's group in Cheshire, Connecticut. Uh, he's our traffic engineer, licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. And also, uh, the final uh, panelist we have tonight is Dr. Donald Poland of Goldman and York in East Hartford. Uh, he is addressing the fiscal impact and planning, and he's also a planning consultant addressing our conformity with the plan of conservation development uh, and zoning criteria, uh, at, but primarily focusing fiscal impact. Uh, and also, he has a report with respect to um, property values in the area. So your site plan package consists of a number of sheets. So you got a cover sheet and zone change map, of course. You need the zone change map. That's what you would be approving, uh, as well as a general plan of development map and a general utility plan. 
Uh, that's basically what we've submitted for large scale maps, followed by commercial architectural elevations and renderings by uh, Mr. Wagner, and also renderings and floor plans of the four residential buildings and the residential community clubhouse uh, submitted by Mr. Wentz. Mr. Brown has submitted a full traffic impact study that you have uh, been sent, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Poland's report uh, entitled the Zoning Change Review and Municipal Fiscal Impact Analysis. Uh, and as I mentioned, he did a three-page report on the impact of multifamily residential on abutting properties. So he's done that. He also um, reviews it in, in part in his uh, lengthy report of the municipal analysis. Uh, we have also submit a narrative statement, a statement on affordable housing. We were asked to do that, uh, how we're doing it. It'll be in depth at the second phase of the application, if, if you're so kind as to approve our application. And then we also submitted three cross sections, uh, two of, the, of which are depicting Sullivan Avenue in relationship to the residential buildings that Mr. Wentz has designed, and also one depicting uh, our closest residential building in relationship to the Strawberry Fields development including the buffer in between. So we have those three that we've submitted. The Sullivan Avenue mixed use development overlay zone regulations were adopted to allow mixed use developments containing compatible and complementary commercial and multifamily residential uses. That's why the architects had to work together as a team, uh, only in the general commercial zone along Sullivan Avenue. It's the only place where this can happen. Now, the purposes were to revitalize the area, to provide high quality development and to increase housing opportunities in South Windsor. In this presentation, you will see just how we are meeting these lofty regulatory goals of the commission. Uh, I'd like to now move into our development review. It is a, as you've probably seen in the documentation as in members of the commission, other people, it is a roughly $30 million mixed use development uh, right now in its present condition. Uh, it is not generating the tax revenues nor the employment base uh, nor the amenities that this town uh, is learned to respect and love. Uh, so we are going to, we're going to modify that considerably and come up with a brand new beautiful development. So we're proposing to renovate the three existing commercial buildings. Now, by the way, let me just mention that the hot leather building will be raised in favor of the residential component. But so we're going to have three existing commercial buildings, um, which consist of about 60,740 square feet of space. So those will all be renovated. Uh, and then we're going to develop 125 luxury apartments adjacent to those in four buildings, uh, along with a beautiful clubhouse building. Uh, the unit mix for those residential, although Mr. Wentz will get into further detail with respect to units, but unit mix is 17 studio apartments. Uh, that's 13.6% of the total 125 units. Uh, you require a minimum 10% studio units. Uh, we also have 66 one-bedroom units. That's 52.8% of the units that are proposed of the 125. Uh, there's no requirement for that, no minimum or maximum. Uh, and then we have 42 two-bedroom units, which represents 33.6% of the total 125 units. And as you know, uh, during our negotiations and your deliberations uh, with respect to the text amendment, zoning text amendment application, uh, you resolved to uh, put an upper cap of 35% for two bedroom units. So we're also meeting that regulatory requirement. So Tim will further discuss the residential design and David, the commercial design. As I mentioned, they've worked together toward a, the goal, your goal of a compatible and complementary design solution architecturally uh, between the two components of the mixed use development. So let's go to the uh, site plan exhibit. Can I be recognized for sharing and also Ben Wheeler? Is that possible, Mike? Okay, can you change it to Ben Wheeler then, please? He has access to all the exhibits and even if back up in the event we uh, have an issue with uh, one of the other design team members. And, and Mike, if I could interrupt for one moment too, could you please admit uh, Greg Nanny as well? Uh, I think he's in as the attendee and hasn't been admitted as a panelist yet, and he represents the applicant. He, oh, yes. Okay, thank you very, thank much, you very much, Mike. Okay, so Ben has been recognized, so he's now sharing content. Good. Okay, here's the uh, initial exhibit we're just presenting to you is the um, is the development color exhibit of the development in reference to the overall uh, ortho photo of the overall neighborhood, uh, Sullivan Avenue, Ayers Road. 
um, strawberry fields, uh, the development across the street, other neighborhoods around there, uh, and commercial developments. So the main commercial building in the center, uh, center left, as Ben is indicating, uh, will be will be anchored by a new Geisler's grocery store, uh, and Bob Rybick will be speaking at the very end of our presentation with respect to that, his commitment for that. Uh, it'll be it'll be a you know a new state of the art grocery store uh, and beautiful. Uh, and we'll also have numerous additional tenants on the easterly end of the building to the right of Geisler's. Outbuildings include the restaurant with a drive-through, replacing the closed key bank. Uh, and a C store replacing the oil and lube building. Uh, the, both the buildings have been vacant for quite some time, as well as the easterly end of the uh, the retail center. Uh, the restaurant parking will be adjacent to the building uh, on the south side of it, uh, and we're also extending the. There we go, blow up. We're also extending the drive through. Uh, the drive through was, I say, wholly inadequate with respect to the bank. Uh, for the bank drive up and for a restaurant, uh, we think it should be elongated and we have done that. And you'll notice that if you know the existing facility, the existing facility, uh, the parking for the bank, there's a little bit of parking on the east side of it, but the parking for the bank where I used to go uh, do my banking, um, you'd park across the main access drive uh, into the main parking lot in that general area. That's where virtually everyone parked other than the employees. Uh, so you had to walk across uh, the traffic uh, to get to the bank building. Uh, in this case, we're going to have ample parking uh, for the restaurant, for most um, customers that are, uh, that are um, going to that particular facility, uh, and any overflow can go into our main parking lot farthest away from the retail center. Uh, we, oh, by the way, we also, in the event, if you go back to that, Ben, you would, um, in the, uh, because of uh, the COVID and things are changing, uh, patio dining has become more and more important to people. And we believe even after the pandemic, when it's in our rearview mirror, we'll still uh, be looking for outdoor dining options for people, especially during better weather conditions, uh, like we, we've had at some restaurants at Evergreen Walk and others, but uh, town staff and the commission have been allowing that. Uh, and the state government as well uh, during this pandemic, but we think that's going to be an ongoing thing. Patios are a good thing, so we have ample room, room for a patio if a tenant so desires uh, at that particular location. We will have uh, 266 parking spaces serving the commercial buildings. Uh, as you can see, the parking lot will, uh, the parking bays will be separated by landscaped islands. Uh, and they will have lighting within those islands and around the perimeter of the parking lot, uh, which will be uh, dark sky compliant lighting, so we don't have off-site off -site illumination, it only uh, illuminates below it. The commercial parking is at, uh, at uh, each of the outbuildings uh, in the main lot and to the west side of the retail center, and also there's a parking area to the rear of the retail center. Um, we're contemplating there may be a restaurant or two in there, might, might be prospective tenants, uh, something of that nature. And we also have provi provided a patio off to the east side of that bay there, um, southeast corner of the building for outdoor dining or beverages um, for a restaurant, um, should we attract one for the balance of the retail center. Uh, while it, uh, we have a circumferential drive into the site and around the main retail building, as Ben will indicate, uh, delivery trucks will be directed uh, to take a right when they come in to the boulevard entrance and go down the west side, uh, as they often do today, uh, to serve Geislers. But we're going to be directing all of our primary, the larger delivery trucks to go that way. They'll plant ample room to turn around, recirculate back out the same way they came in. Uh, and that we're going to be through leases prohibiting uh, general truck traffic for deliveries um, out the easterly end of that uh, and around the building closer to the residential area. We don't want that to occur. Uh, so there'll be prim primarily just passenger vehicles uh, going around the east end of the building and any fire apparatus because we need to have a fire lane around it as well. Two entrance drives are to the multifamily uh, area to the east. Uh, and a loop around the main building. So you can see that you can go in two different points and you can loop around the main building and then back out. Uh, so that we think that's appropriate for um, fire apparatus and for convenience of the public who are residing there or guests. Uh, the clubhouse is on the southwest corner. Uh, 
Tim Wentz will be discussing that and its amenities, uh, as well as all the amenities for the other residential buildings. Uh, like residential is on set, proposed to be on a 7.3 acre parcel, uh, and the commercial to the west will be on 11.8 acre parcel. And uh, through your newly adopted regulations, the um, we're allowed to have it uh, to bisect the property into two parcels. Of course, it will be cross travel easements, utility easements, uh, and the like. Uh, we'll be installing uh, 4,100 lineal feet of sidewalks, including uh, we have about 220 feet from the wet the, our driveway to the west, connecting to uh, that gap. There's a gap right now, uh, Tartsinas development to the west, also known as the Mexicali Grill area with multiple buildings, and beyond that, Twin Plaza. Um, there's a gap there. We're going to be filling that gap. Uh, so again, we have, we're building, uh, proposing to build 4,100 lineal feet of sidewalks throughout our site, including filling that gap in up on Sullivan Avenue. We'll have pedest pedestrian improvements uh, at the signalized intersection, and Mr. Brown will be addressing that during his uh, presentation. Uh, so it's for safe uh, passage uh, through that intersection for pedestrians. Um, and also he'll address how we're going to be uh, renovating that that signalized intersection because we know when we go to the state, they'll be imposing that on us. Uh, we won't have to go to the Office of State Traffic Administration for a permit. This is a large enough development for that. So that's one of the state permits we'll be required to have. Uh, there'll be a new pedestrian connection from the intersection, our new intersection to uh, the shopping center down through the parking lot. Uh, and uh, there'll be sidewalks throughout the development. So all along the main access drive, all throughout the residential community, uh, up and around the uh, restaurant, uh, uh, over from our drive over to the uh, uh, proposed C store on the Northwest corner uh, and uh, throughout the development. So as I said, that's, I think it's about three quarters of a mile of sidewalks we're going to be building. Uh, right now, there's very little in the way of on-site pedestrian ways uh, and we will certainly be uh, addressing that. We have, uh, uh, incidentally, the multifamily development uh, will meet your regulations for one and a half spaces per unit. That's 188 parking spaces. And of course, there are gonna be cross uh, ability to park anywhere uh, that you need to. Um, they could go over even into the commercial if need be, but um, that'll be addressed uh, in their second application. As for the buffer treatments, again, see abutting multifamily development. Why don't we go to, if you look at the pan in just on the southeast corner of this, if you could first, Ben. And you can see this is what we're proposing in that area. And then if we could go, so you can see the woods in between our development and existing uh, strawberry fields development. But then we go to the orthophoto with our development superimposed thereon, and we'll discuss that. Incidentally, while we're getting that up, I just want to make note that uh, at the invitation of Strawberry Fields, uh, we met with the uh, Strawberry Fields community uh, virtually, the number of people participating on April 1st, and that was taped by our office and furnished to, I know uh, Mayor Andrew Paterna is one of the members of there. He actually um, organized the event, uh, open to all of course, uh, and we shared that with them, a tape of the meeting uh, that we held with them so that all of their residents could uh, review that, those who were unable to participate in our initial uh, virtual meeting with them that we had uh, again at the 1st of April. Uh, they have an existing 25 foot evergreen, incidentally our firm designed that development, Story Fields, and they have an existing 25 foot uh, buffer with uh, sporting evergreen trees uh, all along it. It's established, it's maturing. It's roughly uh, the first development started in I think the year 2000, but uh, you know, it's 15 to 20 years old. Uh, so we have an existing evergreen tree buffer there. Uh, and then behind that are trees that will remain. Uh, the uh, regulations that you adopted back in January last year uh, requires that we have twice that amount of buffer on our side of the property line. So instead of 25 feet they have now existing, we're going to augment that with an additional 50 foot buffer. Uh, so we'll have a full 75 foot buffer width between the properties. Most of the existing trees in, on our property within our buffer area are to remain. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll augment that with new evergreen trees on our side of the buffer and other plantings. Uh, beyond, be, and even beyond the buffer, we're proposing to do that. Uh, so interplant along the edge of it and supplement it. Beyond that, you can see some visual representations that our landscape architect, Van Wheeler, uh, has depicted on the plan. 
Okay. Um, incidentally, from the uh, southeast corner of the 36 unit building, which Mr. Wentz will be reviewing, that that corner, the, the uh, one corner there, to the uh, closest building uh, at Strawberry Fields between the 75 foot buffer, uh, it's 120 feet to that corner. Uh, ben has oriented the buildings, all of our residential buildings, so it's just the narrow end, narrowest facade of it. Uh, the south end of the building faces to Strawberry Fields, and I believe uh, the 36 unit building, which is the closest one, uh, it's a 61 feet across uh, from the southeast corner to the southwest corner, uh, that end of the building. And there are very limited windows at that end, and Mr. Wentz can address that if you'd like during his presentation. Uh, also, the buffer actually functions as a berm. Uh, the elevations of the buildings, the first floor elevations for both Strawberry Fields and for our buildings, the closest building, the 36 unit building, uh, it's a walk up building, uh, they are the same. First floor is the same, uh, but they're in between. There's a it's function and a natural berming effect. Uh, it goes up and then we drop down into our development uh, for to to accentuate uh, the screening effect. Uh, and everything on their side again remains, uh, and including the trees to backdrop behind their maturing evergreen trees uh, that we designed previously. Again, they only have 25 feet to work with, and we have 50 feet to work with plus areas adjacent to that. Tim uh, and Tim will also be addressing uh, how we um, pr are providing accessibility to luxury units. At one point, uh, I know during our prior discussions uh, about the zoning text amendment and also about the future development, it was suggested uh, by a number of commissioners uh, that we provide um, accessibility to many of the units. We're doing that and Tim will address that with respect to first floor and also an elevator um, in our largest building. The pool itself, uh, we moved the building back closest uh, on the west side, uh, just east side of the retail building. We moved that residential building to the rear uh, and we put the uh, one story community building, uh, the clubhouse building there with a the pool. The pool itself is I believe about 300 feet away from the closest strawberry field dwelling unit. Uh, it's, uh, and, uh, and there are, but one other point with respect to the uh, southerly or end of the buildings that face towards Harvey Field, so this is the narrowest part of the building, uh, that has no entrances and no porches, and Tim can review that with you uh, in, during his presentation following mine. As per the regulations, 10% of our units will be affordable. Uh, that's 13 dwelling units. Uh, we designed for uh, bicycle movement, bicycle racks. Bicycle racks are throughout the development. Uh, so we've addressed that as I already mentioned, we're addressing pedestrian movement. Uh, and one other thing, uh, Ben Wheeler, and I know Barry Clark was also involved early on in uh, some of our engineers. Uh, we, we have achieved uh, very modest grades throughout the development with respect to pedestrian access. I think the absolute maximum grade would be 5% for any pedestrian walking between the residential and the commercial. We wanted to facilitate that uh, so they can go back and forth. Uh, we propose, we're proposing that uh, in view of your uh, EV regulations, that we'll have 3% of our parking will be um, at EV, electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, that means uh, 14 spaces out of our 454 total spaces within the development. So we're gonna have that distributed and we'll identify those spaces when we get into the engineered site plan, which is the second application around uh, that the commission requires in the regulations, not during this phase, but later on. Uh, other considerations, we've met all dimensional and other requirements of these uh, Sullivan Avenue mixed use development overlay zone regulations uh, to the level required for general plan. Uh, I know Michelle will probably cover a lot of that more in detail. You can look at our zoning data block, um, but we do meet the dimensional requirements and all the other requirements to our knowledge. Uh, we also meet the goals and objectives of the plan of conservation development. Uh, I know Donald, Dr. Donald Poland has discussed that uh, I'm sure Michelle will discuss it as well, but including uh, such things as support for mixed use developments along this part of Sullivan Avenue. Uh, you clearly state that in your plan of conservation development uh, in order to improve the environment there. Uh, providing pedestrian and bicycle circulation, uh, limiting curb cuts along Sullivan Avenue, and approving the appearance of existing business areas, as well as enhancing housing opportunities for town residents. And we certainly are doing that. 
this whole shopping center, uh, which is uh, uh, obsolete and dates back to the 1950s without substantial improvements since that time, will become a modern, beautiful, traditional style um, shopping center. Uh, and it's going to be beautiful, both the commercial buildings and the commercial center, the entire property, all acreage, as well as the residential components, the multifamily building, buildings uh, and its clubhouse component. Uh, as for the zone change criteria, uh, Dr. Poland has addressed those in his report, pages six through eight. I'm sure you've seen that in preparing for this uh, hearing tonight. I might add that under criterion four, uh, there's no land available in the proposed SAMUD zone whatsoever. Um, and uh, for mixed use developments, really the only area in town that I can recall the really allowed for mixed use developments at all uh, is in the gateway development zone. Uh, and it's only represented at Evergreen Walk right now. Uh, so that's the only place where you can do mixed use developments, uh, as I recall. Uh, the Economic Development Commission endorsed this application unanimously uh, recently, the last couple of weeks. We made a presentation to them, we had an in-depth uh, discussion with them. Uh, it was a fun meeting and uh, they did endorse it. And you should probably, I believe you have the, the letter. Uh, also, um, Dr. Poland will note uh, in his presentation, there's an eight fold increase in annual taxes for this proposal, a proposed $30 million development over what is now yielded uh, from this aging and largely vacant shopping center. Uh, next up, uh, we, I'd like to introduce uh, Benjamin Wheeler, who's our Director of Operations and Landscape Architect, Director of Landscape Architecture and Licensed Professional Landscape Architect in the state of Connecticut. He's going to go into further depth with respect to the proposed development. Ben? Thank you, Peter. I just wanted to touch on a few items, uh, not uh, try not to repeat anything that Peter had gone over. Um, one thing as far as circulation is concerned, uh, near the uh, intersection that we are proposing to improve, uh, you may recall that uh, the old uh, gas station, the old uh, oil change uh, place, currently has a, a curb cut on Sullivan Avenue actually within the intersection because uh, it's east of the stop bar. Um, we're proposing to close that off to get it away from the intersection and replace it with a right in right out. Uh, as far away from the intersection as possible uh, to the west end of the site. So uh, that along with the signal improvements um, and the other changes to the circulation we think will really improve the circulation uh, as you're entering and, and leaving the site. Um, a couple other things uh, and just wanted to piggyback on what Peter said uh, and I'm sure Tim will cover this too, but all entrances to the buildings will be ADA accessible. Uh, so when you take into consideration the ground floor units of each of the buildings uh, and the 41 unit building, this building here, which will have an elevator, uh, over half of the units proposed will be accessible up to the, uh, the unit entrance. And then obviously some of them will also be uh, accessible units meeting the codes uh, required for that as well. Um, as far as utilities are concerned, uh, we are proposing all new utilities uh, to the multifamily units. Uh, also replacing the sanitary sewer system with a new pump station uh, located to the rear of the uh, Geisler's portion of the retail building, um, which will be pumped up to the sanitary sewer system in Sullivan Avenue. Um, more details on all that will obviously be shown at the uh, site plan stage, uh, assuming uh, or if you happen to approve this portion of the application. Uh, we are proposing a detention area to the rear of the, uh, the big retail building. Um, this will serve uh, both the commercial spaces and the multifamily um, and, and will uh, serve for water quality and for attenuation of stormwater. Um, we do anticipate that there will be a little bit of wetlands disturbance uh, to widen the uh, emergency vehicle and circulation access to the east of the retail building. So we're also propo proposing a wetlands mitigation area. Um, near existing wetlands uh, at the southern end of the commercial area. Um, just touching on the landscaping uh, a, a bit, uh, we are showing an indication, as Peter uh, mentioned, of the proposed landscaping. Uh, obviously, more details to come later uh, as this uh, application progress progresses and um, process progresses. And uh, the applicant is obviously committed to extensive landscaping, a huge improvement over what is out there today. Uh, we are trying to save some of the mature trees along Sullivan Avenue, um, in particular next to the, uh, the smallest residential building, 
are proposing a retaining wall whose sole purpose is to uh, help save on the save some of the existing mature trees um, that are in uh, good shape along Sullivan Avenue. Um, but obviously, we haven't uh, done a detailed grading plan. So at this point, so uh, as we get into the uh, full engineering, we'll we'll take a look at that uh, again with the full intention intention of trying to save those trees. Um, and also just wanted to clarify one thing that Peter said regarding the uh, parking uh, for the multifamily. Uh, he did allude to that we are uh, taking into account the fact that the commercial spaces can be shared for excess parking uh, for the apartment buildings. Um, in the regulations, uh, when that is the case, there is a formula that is uh, presented uh, that is based on the number of units of the each, uh, each breakdown of units, the studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Uh, when uh, and we indicate underneath the uh, the zoning table on our plans that formula. When that formula is calculated, 174 spaces are required uh, based on our unit breakdown, and we are proposing 188. So we are uh, proposing a few more uh, than what is required for that formula, uh, but again. Uh, there will be uh, accommodations for overflow parking into the commercial areas. Um, as far as uh, uh, bus shelter is concerned, we are proposing a, a bus shelter location uh, near the northerly of the two access points, uh, vehicular access points to the multifamily area. Um, we spoke with Ms. Leip, who had had conversations with the uh, transportation coordinator at the South Windsor School System. Uh, they indicated that the uh, buses, uh, if there are children uh, that will be riding the school bus from this development, uh, the school buses will be entering the site uh, and their preferred circulation path is to circulate similar to the, uh, the delivery traffic around behind the retail uh, building so they don't have to cross in front of it, circulate up the east side and then that will put them in prime position uh, with the uh, the door on the passenger side right near the bus shelter and they will continue to circulate out uh, of the site and to the schools. Um, as Peter had alluded to, uh, we are showing uh, bicycle racks uh, throughout the development, um, at least one uh, at each building uh, as is required uh, in the uh, regulations that were adopted uh, by this commission last year. Um, and we are showing uh, more than are required and the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals uh, guidelines for short-term parking, which is what uh, your regulations reference. And again, that calculation is shown on our under our zoning data table, um, and we are far exceeding that. Um, so with that, uh, I think that wraps up our portion of the presentation. Um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and then turn it over to uh, uh, Kwesi Brown um, to uh, go over his uh, uh, traffic study that uh, he and his firm completed. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, good evening. Uh, for the record, uh, Kwesi Brown with uh, SLR, uh, licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. We, we did a traffic study to assess the impact of the proposed development on the adjacent roadway system. Uh, we identified our study area to be uh, the nearest five intersections uh, in the vicinity of the site and then proceeded to do a detailed uh, traffic and safety uh, evaluation. Uh, from the safety um, perspective, we collected traf um, safety or crash data from the um, um, Yukon Crash Data Repository from 2017 to 2020. Um, within the, the, the project corridor. Uh, we identified that there were about 62 crashes over the, the three-year period. Uh, no fatalities, 64% uh, of, of the crashes were uh, property damage or involved property damage and about 36% injuries. Uh, most uh, significant portion of these um, crashes were rear end col um, collisions. And that's pretty understandable for this kind of corridor. And that has been an experience that you typically tend to find more rare collisions uh, for this kind of uh, state um, roadway. Um, we also looked at sight lines uh, from the side driveway, from the Chrysler um, driveway, and the sight lines uh, exceed uh, the minimum requirements for the posted speed limit uh, of 40 miles per hour. Um, in terms of the traffic um, data, we did an extensive data collection 
um, early uh, part of uh, this year, January and February, uh, in, during a typical weekday, morning and afternoon, but uh, and also Saturday, midday peak period. Uh, and then um, we identified the peak hours. Uh, we noticed that due to COVID, that the traffic volumes that we collected were uh, lower, a little lower than uh, you would typically find on Sullivan Avenue. So we coordinated with DOT, and then based on our, co our coordination and discussion, we factored these volumes up to really replicate uh, what is typical for this kind of corridor. Um, we then went ahead to um, determine the traffic that will be generated by the proposed development using IT trip generation manual. We also did future projections uh, of, of traffic. We projected traffic uh, five years down to 2026, and by which time we anticipated the proposed development will be in place. Um, and then proceeded to do um, our capacity analysis or level of service analysis. Um, and I'm sure everybody is, is familiar with level of service A through F, A great free flow conditions, F uh, not so great. Um, and based on, on our analysis, uh, we determined that overall levels of service uh, with the development in place, uh, the study intersections uh, would be acceptable. Um, at the Hillside Drive intersection, uh, we did notice that um, currently uh, that um, approach operates at a level of service E and is expected to continue to operate uh, at that level of service in the future. So um, we, 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 it's our opinion that the, the proposed development is not significantly uh, impacting levels of service within the uh, project area. And um, the traffic volumes from this development can be accommodated. Um, having said that, um, he, he, um, Peter and, and uh, alluded to the fact that we'll be looking to improve uh, the traffic signal at the Geisler driveway. Um, we will um, be working with the Connecticut DOT. They own the signal to make sure that, you know, the um, equipment is upgraded. Additionally, um, given that there's a residential component, we think it's vital that uh, we safely accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists. So there's going to be a dedicated pedestrian phase that is going to be introduced at this traffic signal as well. Um, additionally, um, we will be coordinating with OSTA uh, given the size of the development, um, they will be reviewing this as well. So uh, we are comfortable that, um, you know, we're going to make sure we dot it all I's and cross all our T's uh, to make this project a, a successful one. Um, so with that, I believe I will hand over to Dr. Poland. Is that? That's correct. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the Commission. Could I ask to have sharing capabilities for a very short PowerPoint? Thank you. Appreciate that. Bear with me a moment here as I get my screen set up. All right, and away we go. So good evening, Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Donald Poland. I'm with the firm of Goman York, based in East Hartford, Connecticut. Hopefully you can uh, see my slide presentation here. And essentially tonight, I'm just going to run you through the highlights of my report. It was a very detailed report, as we see the table of contents here on the right-hand side. There is a very uh, in-depth analysis of the zone change application and land use planning, your POCD, uh, on page five. I'm not going to focus on that tonight because I think some of the other components are more important related to the municipal fiscal impacts. Uh, therefore, I'm going to cover the sections starting with changing retail landscape and demographics through to uh, housing, uh, proposed housing enrollment projections, then municipal fiscal impacts. At the end of the day, just to kind of summarize some of the highlights of the retail, changing retail landscape section, uh, the fact is it is changing. We often hear about the retail apocalypse, and it is true that the retail industry has been disrupted. 
That said, it's nuanced. It's not that all retail is going to collapse or bricks and mortar are going to go away. They're still going to persist. And, uh, but it does mean that there's many properties for most properties, they're going to need to find ways to innovate and change what it is they're specifically doing. The planning challenge ultimately is not about resisting change, but it's about embracing and managing change. So whether it's South Windsor or any other community, I would say the same thing. How do we figure out how to make this changing landscape work? Adaptation is the foundation to resilience and uh, those who innovate, innovate, adapt, and shape shift into new hybrid forms are the ones that will ultimately prosper. Geisler's Plaza is adaptable, and I think that's the core of this application. And it can be repositioned uh, to compete and to prosper. And the owners of Geisler Plaza are seeking to do that through this application to create a new hybrid, what I would call a hybrid form or what we call in planning, a mixed use site of both retail and residential. And as I discuss in my report, there's this symbiotic relationship between housing units and ultimately retail spaces. They actually work really well together. And there's numerous similar projects going on around the state at this point in time. I put this graphic here on the changing landscape just to show you that it's sectors or aspects of the retail environment that are suffering the greatest uh, while there are still growth in some other sectors. And it's ultimately the large regional shopping malls uh, that are suffering the greatest overall, but community scale retail and community scale centers are also struggling. From a demographic and housing perspective, when I look at South Windsor, the, the main thing, the first thing that jumps out at me is the fact that you guys are an aging community. The fact is we are an aging state in an aging nation. But if you look down here at median age, South Windsor is, at least from a median age standpoint, I know these numbers are only a little bit different. From a demographic standpoint, they're significant. South Windsor is significantly older than Connecticut and older than the United States. And when populations age, their population, their demographic structure changes. This helps to in part explain changes in fertility rates. On a national scale, our fertility rates uh, are ultimately what are some also called birth rates have been dropping substantially. And the fact is the United States and Connecticut are at fertility rates that are actually cannot replenish the population. More people die per year than persons are born. If it wasn't for immigration, uh, the United States population and the Connecticut population, given enough time, would reach a number of zero. Now, that would be hundreds of years at this point. But that's the condition we're in. This is ultimately then relates to the challenges you guys are having with school enrollments, which directly relate to your single family housing stock, which is 81% single family. 72.8% of that or of the total is uh, detached. 86% owner occupied compared to Connecticut at 65.8 or the nation at 65.8 and Connecticut at 66.9. And your 71.3% of your housing stock has to be bedrooms or more. Last year, existing housing stock generates about 0.47 enrollments per unit. So with a predominantly three bedroom or more single family housing stock, you generate almost a half a enrollment per housing unit. Basically your housing uh, stock is designed for families with children and designed to serve demographics and generations of the past. The fact is we are changing. And that's what this next graphic here is about in 1970, 40% of households were married couples with children. In 2012, that was down to 19.6. It's down to about 17.5 today. Single person households, persons living alone, we see here go from 11.5 for women and 5.6 for men to 15.2 to 12.3. Most notable, married couples without children stays statistically the same over this period of time. 
more helpful to single and one person today than they are families with children. That is the dominant occupant. These images here of television shows basically are mirroring this change over decades and generations. Large families of the past have given way to essentially relationships of friends based on single persons. This is why from 2005 to 2017, you could add almost over 550 housing units and lose 935 school uh, school enrollment or one 1 1.7 enrollments per new housing unit added it's because the demographics of the community are changing statewide enrollments have been declining uh and south windsor was declining i recognize you are not today uh, but your enrollments peaked in 2005 at about 5161 and today there are about 45, 54 in uh, 2020. That's a loss of about 600 uh, enrollments. Your low point was in 2015 and your enrollments have been increasing since then. This top graphic here is state housing permits. One thing I wanna make clear is in the past, the 60s, the 80s, the 70s, we built a lot of housing in Connecticut. We don't build very much housing anymore from the 90s through the 2000s, and then this is since the crash of the market in 2008. What you do notice here though, in this last little bit, is multifamily has become a much larger share of Connecticut's housing production than it was in the past. I don't want you to think you're abnormal or some exceptional place because you've seen a lot of multifamily as of late. The state has seen a lot of multifamily as of late. I also know there's concerns at the elementary school level, uh, and there's concerns about the location of our proposed development in the Eli Terry School District. I wanna be clear here, it's not multifamily studios, one and two bedrooms that generate school-aged children. Look at your own data, recent developments, Evergreen Walk and residents at Oakland, and you'll see the generation rate into your school system is 0.18 and 0.17 uh students per unit but then look at the single family the recent single family housing development where those rates go to 1.06 to 0.86 and down here uh states of south windsor single family in the eli terry schools generating 1.2 it's single family housing that ultimately creates the largest amount of new school-aged children this new development collectively though is generating 0.42 per unit that's less than your town-wide 0.47 and that's due to the fact that you're aging fertility rates are declining and the struct demographic structure of the population is changing so i did calculations as i know i presented to you in the past at our preliminary discussions on this of using the rutgers demographic multipliers testing against your own town data and ultimately come up with uh Public school aged children or enrollments generated by this development would be a total of 14. That's running at about 0.11 uh, rather than the 0.17 or 0.18 that you saw with Evergreen. The key thing here is the percentage of studios, the high percentage of one bedrooms and the lower percentage overall of two bedrooms. That's keeping the numbers or that ratio lower. Evergreen has performed as low as 0.14 in past years by your Board of Ed studies. Uh, new to district in those prior studies, uh, your Board of Ed studies are showing that basically new to district enrollments are fluctuating between 13 and 30% of total enrollments. We use 50% to be conservative and ultimately come up with nine enrollments being new to district. Do the rounding up that actually ends up 63% is new to district, more than double the high found in your own studies. I then did calculations to set up for the municipal fiscal impact. Total expenditures uh, per total enrollment per new to district enrollment. A local share expenditure where I only look at local property taxes. I back out the intergovernmental revenues from your budget. And that brings us down to about 15,000 in spending per student. 
and then allocated where I back out those things in the education budget that are not impacted by changing enrollments, things like utilities, building maintenance, and so forth and so on. And that brings us down to about uh, just under 10,000 per student spending. Once again, done for total and also uh, calculated for new to district. Which brings me to the summary of findings on the fiscal impact. The real estate property taxes for the residential component are estimated at approximately 500,000. The commercial uh, building after renovation is estimated at about 183,000. Property tax on motor vehicles associated with 125 multifamily units, approximately 50,000. Calculated in then the sewer user fees per year and, uh, for the residential component, also for the commercial component. Gross revenue of uh, $787,000 back out the new to district allocated school enrollment costs for the new to district and then also adjust for government services general government services police fire everything else planning and zoning uh, for both the residential and the commercial and we come up with another approximately in government expenditures costs about 252,000 that means net fiscal positive of over a half million dollars at the end of the day in revenue. And then we also calculated one time uh, permitting fees, approximately three quarters of a million dollars in permitting fees. Economic impacts uh, essentially create or sustain approximately 100 construction jobs, 20 permanent jobs. That's not including sustaining the jobs associated with uh, Geisler's uh, currently. And then 4.2 million in discretionary consumer spending based on the occupants of the 125 units. And approximately very conservatively, we estimate about a half million dollars in direct spending uh, in your community. The reason why that number runs low is because as you all know, our lives span the vast area. Uh, we live at the metropolitan scale and spend money when we go away on vacation and when we're at work, out of town, and so forth. Last, I know there were some concerns raised. I had addressed kind of the importance of investment and the impact of investment on property values in my initial report. But I know some concerns were raised about the potential impact of new development uh, especially the multifamily development proximate to other properties, specifically residential development. I've been researching and looking at these studies for years now in the abundance of research, uh, both academic and industry wide has shown that, uh, that claims of negative property impacts from new development are not substantiated. Uh, MIT found high density mixed on income rental developments in single family neighborhoods does not affect the value of surrounding homes and fear of potential asset value loss by suburban homeowners is misplaced. Harvard found, uh, Harvard found apartments pose no threat to su surrounding single family home values. University of Utah reaffirmed these that actually showed that uh, no reduction in home values and property values within a half mile of multifamily rental developments actually experienced increases. Another study showed that single family home values uh, shows an increase in single family home values near denser development. National home builders, single family residential properties within 300 feet of multifamily uh, rental housing increased by 2.9%. I'm not going to beat you up here, Virginia Tech, and so forth. Ultimately, the overwhelming finding of the unbiased academic research is that apartments pose no threat to surrounding single family property values and the fear of potential asset value uh, loss among suburban homeowners is misplaced. Uh, in closing, I mean, ultimately, my report details how this uh, proposal complies with the comprehensive plan of zoning and the plan of conservation and development. I think we show, oh, in just worst case scenario, if you get all 14 students at the full blown, you know, total expenditure, divide enrollments into the uh, 
into the uh, total education budget, you still end up 390,000 fiscal positive, uh, even if we run the worst case scenario. So the fact is, this is a good development. It will not have negative fiscal or negative property value impacts on the town of South Windsor. I thank you for your time and I'm available for questions whenever you choose to do so. Thank you. Yes, and now we're going to turn it over to architect Tim Wentz from Gate 17. Okay, if I can get the screen share. Okay, I see I have it. That'd be Michael. Back with that. We'll get this up. Can you see the exhibit of yes. the 12 unit building? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and I'll blow this up so that you can see it a little bit better. Uh, as been previously testified, there are four residential buildings on the site. There is a 12 unit building, which is what you are looking at right now. There are two 36 unit buildings and there is one 41 unit building. And then in addition to that, we have a community clubhouse. One of the things that we like to do to cut down on the overall massing is three actual things. The first is to vary material and color. And what you're seeing here is a combination of vertical siding, which is occurring here in white, which is gray and in the tan areas, and brick, which uh, is the base of the building. Uh, the second thing that we like to do is to take the elevation uh, of the building itself and vary it so that no individual length of the building is excessively long. We want to avoid having a boxy shaped building. And there are components of this building like in this location here in the center location and at the end here that actually jut out from the back of the the back plane here approximately two feet and then we inset where we have balconies approximately seven feet so there's a tremendous variety of uh, facades that occur in this building and then finally the third thing that we like to do is to vary the roof plane nobody wants to see a building that has a single ridge line that goes all the way across. So the pitch of the roof follow the uh, building as it projects and it uh, recedes. And so what you wind up getting is a varied roof line here. And the other thing that we like to do is to have a combination of a gable roof and a hip roof. And this, again, gives you a tremendous amount of variety. What you're looking at in this building, which is 12 units, is a single entrance located right here. And then we have one apartment on this side and one apartment on that side. And then we have two more apartments in the back. Then what we do is we repeat those apartments on the second and the third floor. So what we're doing is we're creating what we call in the industry a 12 unit cube. Uh, the entrance is of course, as, it, as Ben had mentioned to us, is handicap accessible and all of the units on the first floor are handicap accessible. And then we have a walk up situation, a single stairway that goes to the second floor units and the third floor units. Now, another part of the testimony was that we worked very closely with the uh, commercial architect to make sure that we were compatible. Our basic theme is in the New England vernacular, and we chose brick to anchor the buildings at the base that was the same color and the same type of brick that will be used on the commercial buildings. Now, the next slide that you will see is the rear elevation 
and the side elevation. Now, it's important to note that when you're looking at the rear elevation, you'll recognize right away that it's very, very similar to the front elevation. And the same with the sides. We're varying the roofs, we're varying the colors, we're varying the ins and outs, we're taking our expensive materials and bringing them all the way around our buildings. The materials that we use on the front are the same built materials that we use in the back. Uh, another thing that you will notice is that each unit has a large balcony with sliding glass doors that come out to it. So every unit has a private balcony. The units also have very large windows. You can see here in this configuration that the buildings are, each one of these windows is three feet by five feet. So you can see that we're having windows which are triple windows, which are double windows. And of course we have the big six foot sliders. The windows here, which you are seeing, these square three by three windows are windows which occur in areas like kitchens and bathrooms. It's very important that we have units that have a tremendous amount of light in them. We want them to be light and we want them to be airy. And this is what makes these uh, buildings that we do so popular. The next slide is of the 36 unit building. Now, the first thing you will notice is that it's very similar to the 12. It's similar uh, in terms of materials. Again, we're using vertical siding, horizontal siding, brick, and we're varying the roof line. Now, we talked about cubes in the 12 unit building. A 36 unit building consists of three cubes. We have this one right here, we have the center cube, and we have the end cube, the other end. Uh, again, what we're doing is we're creating three separate entrances located here, here, and here, and they access four units per floor in each cube. So there is a tremendous amount of privacy for the units. You can see where we're varying the roof line, and of course what we're using is an architectural slate colored uh, roof shingle. The rear elevation, again, as I said, if I were to flash the front, front and rear elevations at you quickly, you would say, geez, they're the same. Well, the only difference is that the rear elevation doesn't have the entrances to the building. But again, what you're looking at is similar, similar materials, uh, similar windows, similar balconies for each one of the units. One of the um, concerns in a previous meeting was that they wanted the 36 unit end uh, elevation to be similar to the others. And we have indeed changed that. Uh, Peter had said that there was uh, a bunch of smaller windows we actually have gotten rid of that because of the uh, objections uh, in our previous presentation. So we're opening up the side elevations. We feel that this is much more attractive to the residential development and much more in character with the single family homes that are to the south. This is the larger building. It's 41 units. What makes this building different than the others is that this building has an elevator in it. It typically will have a single entrance and then there will be a corridor which will access each one of the units on each floor. What this does is it allows each unit to be uh, handicap accessible. And one of the things that uh, Ben had testified to was that we are over 50% of our units are handicap accessible. We are divided into type A and type B units. The type A units, if you're familiar with it, are the ones which are more accessible than the type Bs. They are uh, designed for wheelchair accessibility. 2% uh, of those units, of the accessible units, will be that type. Again, 
and I don't want to repeat myself, but the materials are the same with the vertical siding, horizontal siding, and the brick. And you, you can see how we're varying the colors throughout the building so that it breaks it up and it doesn't appear to be just a big, simple box. Again, the rear elevations, um, there's not a lot I can say because they're very similar to the front. And all of these buildings are very similar to each other. And of course, the brick is and the roof is what is tying in this building and these buildings to the retail. The clubhouse. The community center is approximately 3,400 square feet. And you can see here the front elevation, the rear elevation, and the side elevations. What we're doing is we're keeping the same theme for the, build, for the clubhouse as the rest of the residential buildings. In the back near the pool area, we've got a lot of work, community rooms will go out into a patio area and to the pool. As I said, the building is 3,400 square feet and it contains amenities like a large community room, a cafe with a serving kitchen, a gaming room that sometimes is converted into a business center, depending on uh, the COVID virus. We're seeing some of the communities take their gaming rooms and turning them into business centers because of the increase in home offices that it's occurring. There's also the fitness center. There's a separate fitness on demand room. And of course we have our leasing facility because leasing and management is, takes place uh, actually on site. Now this is the 12 unit building. And as you can see, there's a single staircase and there is four units that surround it. Uh, again, the staircase goes up two floors, so you have four times three. And now, now if I were to blow up this one area here, uh, you can see the types of amenities that we put in these units. We have a balcony. Each unit has its own separate balcony. We have granite countertops in the kitchens and we have stainless steel appliances. Each, they have a dishwasher, a sink, a full range, and a large refrigerator. We also have a, in this particular case, a side-by-side -side washer dryer. We have large walk-in closets. And in all of our two bedroom units, we have two beds. There are no two bedroom, one bath units, which you used to see in your apartments in the 50s. Another important thing is that each unit has their own utilities. It has their own air conditioning unit and it has their own hot water heater. Each unit has individual gas meters, electric meters, and water meters so that no tenant is paying an unfair share of the utility expenses for the whole building. Now, as you can see in this particular building, we have four units. These are two bedroom units here, and we have a two bedroom den unit here, which is a little bit larger that wraps around the back of the staircase. The two bedroom units range from 943 square feet to 958 square feet, excuse me, 1108 square feet to 1505 square feet. And there are 40 of these two bedroom units or 32%. The one, the two bedroom den, which is this unit right here, because we can classify this space as a, a den or a home office. There are only two of these units and these are 1,338 square feet. And it's, it takes approximately units. The second and third floor are, again, a repeat of the first. The only difference is in this particular unit, we were able to tuck a, another den behind the staircase. 
in the 24 unit building, or the, excuse me, this is the 36, uh, you can see that we have these three cubes located. We have one here, one in the middle, and one at each end. The front staircase comes in and it surrounds four units. So even within a building that has 36 units, there's a tremendous amount of privacy. Now, the center cube building has a combination of studio units located here and here, one bedroom units located here, and a two bedroom unit located in the back. Now the studio units range from 538 to 703 square feet. And there's 17 of them, it compromises 13.6% of the units. Now typically, when you think of a studio unit, you think of one big room that the bed is in your living room, or you can say your living room is in your bed room. What we do is we put up a half wall located right here. Uh, this goes up approximately seven feet and provides a division between the bedroom and the studio and the living room area so that you don't ever feel like when you're in your bedroom you're sleeping in your living room or when you're watching tv in your living room you're actually watching in your bedroom it provides a separate space but it's not actually a separate room we also have again the stacked washer dryer the stainless steel appliances with granite countertops the individual balconies and the individual HVAC and hot water heaters. So even the smallest units have the same amenities that the larger units do. Now, in the, let's do this. Excuse me. Okay. In the one bedroom unit, uh, it's on the opposite side of the studio and you can see that it's got the large walk-in closet and all the amenities of all the other units. And then the two bedroom unit again wraps around the back. The second and third floor of each one of these cubes uh, is units which are basically the same as the unit below. We stack these units for an efficiency in construction. And then finally, we have our 41 unit building. Now here we go into a center entrance where the elevator is, and then we go into a corridor where we access all our units. This building contains studio. Units. Now, when you have a long corridor like this, we like to open it up at the end. So you're gonna see a window here and a window here so that when you enter the corridor, you're going to have daylight at the end. Now, again, because this is an elevator building, the second floor and the third floor are accessible. This is the second floor and the third floor. Uh, what we do is we have a larger studio apartment here, which wraps around the uh, elevator. And this is more of the traditional single room. And then finally, we have the clubhouse. Now, again, you would enter the clubhouse in this area and we have this large great room or a community room. In there would be flat screen TVs, couches, a see-through fireplace that would access both the great room itself and the cafe. The cafe is a more casual room it too would have a large flat screen over top of the fireplace, but it's going to have high tables and this is a small serving kitchen. Now, when I say a kitchen, really all it has is a warming drawer, a microwave and a, uh, a beverage center and a sink. So it's really for people that are having parties uh, in the great room in the cafe room. And what they would do is they would have caterers come in and they would be able to set up on the kit in the kitchen itself. We then have this game room right here. And one of the things again that I mentioned is that some of our clients are 
uh, converting these game rooms into business centers, which have many offices in them uh, for people that want a home office, but either their apartment can accommodate it where they feel they just want to get out of their apartment sometimes during the daytime. We have a leasing area here that again is used by and over here we have a fitness center which has your usual workout machines and we have a fitness on demand room which is where you've got these custom TVs where you dial into a program on the internet and your uh, punishing person comes on and go, takes you through a, a workout routine like you see on Pelotons. Here we have our bathrooms and showers and they are open to the fitness center and we have a lifeguard area that is accessible to the pool. And one of the things that we like to do is to compartmentalize these buildings because a lot of times the fitness center will be open 24 hours a day, but we want to be able to lock off the rest of the, the, uh, the building so that the fitness center would be able to be accessed at this location uh, after hours. People could come in, they could use the fitness center, and they would still have access to the, the bathrooms or if the fitness center was locked off and they wanted the break room to have a party, they too would have access to the bathrooms. And that pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, again, I can take questions now if you choose, or I can pass it on to our commercial architect. Uh, pass it on, please. Okay, then I will close out of this and turn off my share. Figure out how to do it. And David Wagner is up. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I am Dave Wagner from uh, the project architect for this project for uh, Shadler Sauna Associates in uh, Farmington. Um, I'd like to be able to share my screen if that's possible. Thank you. Hope everybody can see this. Okay. I'd like to start with uh, sort of reminding everybody of what's currently there. Um, on the shopping center side of things. Um, it's a difficult building to get a, a full picture of because it's very linear. Um, I can walk you through the view from um, Sullivan Avenue and of course the anchor store is Geisler's. Um, when we were there, we actually did sort of a walk down of the entire building. Um, as uh, uh, Peter Damali said, you know, the, the building was originated probably in the 50s and 60s and it's had um, some improvements over the years but as you can see not lately um, and it's, it's time uh, I can zoom in into any of this if anybody's interested in seeing some of the existing details any closer um, but I think everybody's probably very familiar with this building um, we had a lot of discussion about what direction we were going to move in this and what we would take inspiration from um, the existing bank building I know is, is going to remain in that area. So that became sort of the primary uh, source of uh, inspiration. I take this away and I'm going to show the new proposed new development. Um, it's very difficult to sort of get this thing in one screen in enough detail where you can really see what's going on here because of the linear part of the building. But we thought about how this was going to relate conceptually to the proposed residential um, use component. Um, and we looked at this as sort of being a New England downtown sort of streetscape, mercantile, you know, goods and services shopping experience for the residents of the new proposed development, but also um, the entire town. Um, 
what was our concept and how do we do it? Well, the linear character of the building, you know, we're kind of working within some of the structural uh, uh, limitations of what we have there now. Um, I included, actually, this is a uh, structural grid. I concluded that there so people get a sense of how some of this stuff is working around with the uh, existing linear or existing um, structural paths. I'm going to hide that because I think that that's uh, sorry. I'm going to hide that because I think this uh, a little little easier to understand what we're doing here. Um, as we move down the building, we said, well, how do we how do we make this look like downtown? How do we make this relate to New England a little better? How do we make this relate to South Windsor a little better? So we thought probably the best way to do it is to articulate this thing as much as we can to break up that sort of linear feel. And to do that, we used shapes and height changes and uh, materials and colors and some architectural details that are consistent with what's going around in, in the town, but also just something that's a, sort of a downtown New England thing. Um, here's that view. We can zoom in here. I think you're all familiar with this. It's conceptual because we may have some changes in tenants depending on how this, this building works out. But the general concept here is going to remain in that we're going to articulate it like this. We're going to use some of these um, um, brick facade structures, some standing seam roofs to pull back some of that brick facade to make it look more like separate buildings, um, more like you're walking down a, 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 a downtown Main Street for your shopping for goods and services. Um, we're proposing some thin brick um, at the high levels just because we've got to be conscious of, uh, of our uh, weight limitations. Um, brick and, and uh, concrete CMU base columns. Um, we're looking at, you know, typical uh, still using the extruded aluminum storefront systems with some precast panels in the base with all masonry here. Uh, we're talking about mixing in some some subtle color differences and subtle material changes um, with some of these projected areas to make them read better as something less linear, something less uniform, and something more like an individual streetscape. Um, we're proposing maybe uh, using some fiber cement panels up high, which can either be, uh, they can uh, mimic some uh, masonry stuff, or they can look like uh, they can be uh, just solid metal. Um, incorporated some of the uh, bent frame truss look that we see a lot of here. We're, we're proposing it's a bent frame truss, but it's really sort of a heavy timber uh, frame look here. Um, but as we go through, you'll see some of the architectural detailing that would be consistent with a New England village. Um, And we sort of worked that theme all the way down throughout the entire building. Um, as you can see here, color inspirations, really we, you know, we, we, we use the existing bank building as something that we'd like to at least come up with a, 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 a masonry look that is similar to what's already in town. We know that bank building is going to stay as, as some form of building or another, um, but we're using really just some colors and materials to help articulate this. Um, the building footprint is only going to change at the facade at the front level. The building's going to stay basically a 60 plus thousand square foot uh, retail space as, as whatever we can get in there at this point. Goods and services is either restaurants or nail salons or whatever is there. But some of the entry locations may be a little flexible depending on uh, what the tenants end up being, but the same general concept is going to stay like it is here. Um, you know, this really truly is just a, it's a facade change of an existing building. Um, that's really all I have I think, for this, short and sweet. Um, I'm going to turn this over, I think, back to uh, David Bauer. Yes, I, I'd like to introduce now uh, Bob Rybick, who's the CEO of Geisler Supermarket Chain. 
uh, who is the owner of the Geislers, the primary tenant in the building, uh, and he would like to address you right now. Okay, uh, before that happens, Peter, uh, it's about five after nine right now. Yes. Um, we're gonna conclude this meeting at 9.30. Uh, okay. So um, if you could, if possible, wrap it up um, uh, after Bob speaks. And um, I hope that all the exhibits that were presented will be sent to the commissioners. Um, I, I really get a little um, upset when I'm seeing these PowerPoints and everything, and they haven't been provided to the commission in advance so the commission can review them. Um, and that's something that um, should be done in the future on all applications. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Rybick is on. Yeah, th thank you, Peter. And um, if it pleases the commission, I'm not quite as long winded as Peter. So I'll, I'll keep this brief and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, as Peter mentioned, my name is Bob Rybick. I'm the president of Geisler Supermarkets. As many of you already know, Geisler's is a locally owned fourth generation family owned and operated business. A lot of people use the word local, but our family and owners are as local as it gets. We have several members, including my cousins, Ryan Nielsen and Eric Nielsen that are residents of South Windsor. As members of the community, we are no, not only in the community, but we are part of it. We have a long history in the town of South Windsor offering personalized service and taking care of community organizations in a way that only a family can. Our business model is one that believes local equals fresh. And by buying from a local grocer, you get the freshest product because we support and purchase directly from local farmers and producers. You will be hard pressed to find another business that goes the extra mile to personally pick up products direct from the source. From my papa's sauce, a startup pasta sauce company from designed by two best friends and made in Manchester, Connecticut, to a plethora of local farms, including Bordeaux Farms, our sweet corn supplier right in South Windsor. Our families, members, employees, and myself go the extra mile to bring the best in local and fresh to our stores. It's our hope that the town will continue to support a locally owned family business so that we can continue to support the town, its schools, charitable organizations, and community groups. Our current situation consists of an obsolete shopping center that desperately needs renovation, as you know. Our vision is for a beautiful new store that embraces the values of local and fresh, as I mentioned, delivers enhancements in variety, meat, produce, bakery, cheese, deli, and foods to go with modern decor and amenities that serve as a model for our future stores. However, if we provide this, a renovated center will not be enough to sustain our business. We face increased competition all around us. Right over the border in Manchester, Target has expanded their grocery aisles and Trader Joe's is now in the mix. More recently, and Aldi has entered, a Costco is planned and a 40,000 square foot grocer is being proposed to replace Old Navy at Evergreen Walk. None of these companies are local, family owned, or will support the town like Geisler's. In order to continue to support the town, continue to deliver the best in local and fresh products in a way that only we can, we need a renovated shopping center and more rooftops with customers in our immediate area. The 125 apartments that are allowed in the regulations and shown on the plan are crucial to our success in South Windsor. Any reduction in the number of apartment, apartments combined with all of the new competition I mentioned would mean our decision to remain would, would be much more difficult. With your support, we hope to fulfill the vision for a beautiful new store in South Windsor and continue to support the community in the process. I ask that you lend your support to the plan and vote in favor when the time comes. And uh, thank you for allowing me to speak and I can take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't believe we have any questions at this time. Peter, does that conclude your presentation? I'd like can to do we, some very can brief. We clear concluding. the screen, please. Clear the screen. Okay, there we go. That's better. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Pascona. So, just a concluding remark. So, one one housekeeping thing I didn't mention uh, when we did the text zoning text amendment, the commission 
restricted the height of buildings to two and a half stories adjacent to single family zone or developments, but adjacent to multifamily or other, you allowed three story buildings. And we're conforming to the three story requirement of your regulations. So just, we believe we are, we've demonstrated conformity with the adopted Sullivan Avenue mixed use development overlay zone regulations. And we think this is an ideal location to apply it. The Sullivan Avenue Plaza will be transformed into a mixed use development, meeting the goals and objectives of not only your regulations, but also the plan of conservation and development. We believe this will be a transformative development and will serve as a catalyst for upgrading this section of South Windsor. It will be a location where all residents, South Windsor residents will want to visit. And from a fiscal impact perspective, this will be an eightfold increase in taxes and will have a positive impact on our overall government operations. And as Dr. Poland indicate, he's asserted that will not have an impact on property values whatsoever. So that concludes our remarks, a formal presentation, and we look forward to hearing from any other comments from individuals or questions from the commissioners. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, we'll turn to our town staff, our director of planning, Michelle Light. Thank you, Chair Katsikotis. In the interest of time, I will give an abbreviated report. You did all receive my report in your packets and it is available online for the public, but I just want to highlight a couple of things for you tonight. So this is a request for a zone change in general plan to change from general commercial zone to the mixed use development overlay zone and the general plan of development for the renovation of 60,000 square feet of commercial space and the addition of 125 apartment units on the property known as Sullivan Ave Plaza in our general commercial zone. You have provided all sorts of information tonight. A lot of it has been reviewed. Just for the commission's benefit, we did adopt this regulation last January of 2020. On the front page, there's a zoning data block which has all the minimum requirements that were established, things such as a minimum of five acres with a maximum of 20 acres for the zone and have 100 feet of frontage on Sullivan Ave. We have impervious coverage for both the residential and the commercial components. We do require a maximum of a two to one ratio of residential square footage to commercial square footage. We do allow the commercial and residential to be owned separately, all things which this applicant is proposing and is meeting the bulk requirements in the regulations. At the time of the zone change request, section 8.3 lists a whole variety of things that we evaluate the zone change under, things like our plan of conservation development, supply, a whole list of those there that I won't read into the record, but those are the basis by which the applicant has addressed the commission tonight. One of the things I do want to highlight is the strategies that we have in our plan of conservation development that are pertinent to this application. In the residential development goals, we say we support housing opportunities that help achieve economic and transportation goals. Specifically, our plan states that new housing in these opportunity areas should support and coexist with commercial development so that housing does not reduce the economic viability of these areas. A mixed use approach is encouraged. We go on to say that we should have these communities planned and laid out to avoid traffic issues. Housing development should minimize curb cuts, provide pedestrian and bicycle connections to nearby commercial uses, and take other measures to reduce congestion issues. The residential density plan highlights the general commercial zone corridor along Sullivan area as an area for potential mixed use development. And the business development section has a stated goal that is encouraging business development in existing business zones and improve the appearance of business zone. Zone change is also time to discuss traffic impacts. We did have a presentation tonight by Kresge Brown on the traffic study that was performed, generally indicating that the existing network can accommodate the traffic being proposed. I did want to read into the record. I did receive comments from Lieutenant Duchesne from the police department that did review the report. They have had concerns at this particular signal for some time. Here and add some video. It's a temporary fix. But he goes on to say that the signal does not have a pedestrian phase. And with the amount of activity proposed with this development across the street, that is a concern that there's a potential for increases in conflicts with pedestrians and cars. So as a part of this project, the police strongly recommend that they work closely with DOT and the developers so that the signals, sidewalks, and pedestrian treatments 
be scrutinized very thoroughly so that we proceed with an abundance of caution when it comes to the safety of this intersection and the surrounding area. So again, we're, this would be something that at the time, um, if it gets to the site plan stage, the police would look at a little bit closer to the design. Um, public, the other utilities, public water and sewer are available to the site. The applicants engineers indicated that they have adequate capacity to support this development. Uh, Tony Manfrey, the superintendent of pollution control has indicated that if any sewer upgrades are necessary, the developer will be responsible for providing these upgrades. Again, at this time, uh, the, we look at the residential development versus commercial development. Um, two of the main questions are the impact on taxes and the number of school children. Uh, we did have a presentation from Dr. Don Poland tonight that uh, addressed that. Uh, looking at our newer residential developments, I was able to obtain data from the school system that it pretty much mirrors what was presented tonight. I will pass it on to the commission for the next meeting, but just to give you open road apartments. We uh, right now have 10 students in the South Windsor Woods, which it's a little different because it's not apartments, they're condos um, to their own. And you have 73 students coming out of that development. What these numbers don't take into effect is the number of students that may be within district transfers. And I think that's, you know, a, um, something that is worth noting, um, but I will pass these on to the commission for the next meeting. So this general plan, um, we ask that the general information be provided. Uh, the detailed engineering is not done at this stage. It's, it provides the commission with a two-step method to determine, uh, first of all, whether a family is appropriate for the site, and then to make any meaning revisions if appropriate before the applicant goes into spending all the engineering dollars. This uh, plan is showing multi-units being proposed in four buildings, three stories in height. Uh, we've been provided the breakdown of 17 studios, 66 one bedroom and 42 two bedroom. Uh, this does meet the mix that the commission did lay out in the regulations. The applicant has indicated that they will be providing the 10% affordable units as required. Uh, they intend to provide them through the studio units. Uh, at the time of special exception site plan, a details and affordability plan would be required uh, as a part of that application. Pedestrian access is being accommodated around the residential and commercial site, including a link of sidewalk along Sullivan Ave the west to tie into the existing sidewalks at the 925 Sullivan Ave Plaza. Bicycle parking requirements are being met. Uh, in several of the areas of residential buildings, there are some retaining walls shown uh, up to eight feet in height. At the time of site plan application, similar to what the concerns the commission have for the Costco walls, we'd like to know the color and designs of the walls since they will be visible from the parking areas. Uh, as mentioned previously, there is a 50 foot buffer required along the property boundary adjacent to the Strawberry Fields condominium complex. Um, the regulations require this be designed by a licensed landscape architect, and we will be looking for views at the five year and maturity to make sure that the views are substantially blocking. Uh, the applicant does intend to use existing vegetation on the site. We would request at the time of site plan that trees of significance be, to be preserved be located in the field. Um, I guess the only concern is that we make sure that we're keeping healthy quality trees and that the buffer will sustain over time. Um, and that's something that can be looked at a little bit closer at site plan. Uh, this regulation does require 400 square feet of recreation area per unit. This requirement is being met through both active recreation, the clubhouse, and then uh, in the outdoor pool. And then they're also showing the preservation of the existing vegetation along the south and eastern property boundaries, which is the criteria we, one of the criteria we have for open space. There are some regulated wetlands on the site and there are activities shown within the wetlands and upland review areas. And the wetlands agency approval is not required for the general plan stage. However, uh, if the planning approves this application, the applicant will fold your environmental planner has reviewed the plan and um, does not have any specific concern as to what's been shown to date. Our architecture design review board uh, did meet with the applicant to review the general plan and architectural elevations on March 18th. The project was generally well received, uh, noting that there is a need for redevelopment in this area. Comments and questions centered around the preservation of trees along Sullivan Ave, views into the site from Sullivan Ave, location, safety and height of the retaining walls, and the use of complementary materials on the commercial and residential buildings. Uh, it was suggested additional elevation to 
Texas be provided, uh, the applicant has provided those and you're reviewing those tonight. Uh, we would recommend that um, if this does go forward to special exception site plan stage, that the applicant return to design review to address, address some of the specific details uh, to the project. The site is not within 500 feet of the town boundary, so we were not required to notify Prague of this application. Um, so just a couple last comments at the site plan stage, in addition to some of the previous comments, some of the things we've asked the applicant to explore are potentially putting a pathway from the first residential building along Sullivan Ave to the traffic light, if grades permit it, document all easements and agreements between the commercial lots, and then show project phasing in accordance with section 5.10 D9 um, of the regulations. If the zone change is approved, the commission must state on the record they found the zone change to be consistent with the town plan of conservation and development. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we'll turn to the town engineer, Jeff Doolittle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a few comments, and some of these I know will be addressed at the site plan stage, but um, I'd like it if the existing building at 1017, that's the existing hot leather building and surrounding parking area could be shown better on the background conditions plan. Um, there is currently a very steep stone slope from Sullivan Avenue down to the existing parking lot in front of that building, um, and I'm concerned that that slope will need to be stabilized better. Um, and with that in mind, I'd like some clarification on how the retaining wall heights were determined. Um, I got slightly different numbers for the retaining walls, um, but obviously I don't have the entire grading plan. So any preliminary grading plan you could provide would be helpful. Um, it would also be helpful to label each of the proposed residential buildings as building one through four or something similar to that. So it's clear which building we're talking about. Um, the sidewalks, just a reminder, the sidewalks that above parking spaces need to be at least six feet wide. Uh, the proposed sidewalk along the main access drive is very close to the drive and should be moved further back to provide better separation for pedestrians and a larger snow shelf. Um, I'd like to know where the stormwater discharge from the proposed detention basin will go. Um, we you talked about the pump station. existing shopping center. I wonder if there's going to be more than one, if there will be any increased separators on the sewer laddles from the existing buildings, um, including the existing bank building. And we will need additional information on the proposed sanitary sewer flows and pump station design. And we are currently checking the capacity of the sanitary sewer main in Sullivan Avenue. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we've got about five minutes. Um, I'm hoping we could uh, turn to the public and um, address um, the letters that were written uh, from the public. Um, Yeah, it's either now or never for tonight. So, um, yeah, please. Hello, uh, my name is Bill Jodas. I live at 32 Green Lane. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I know there was a special exception given at Evergreen Walk to allow a grocery store. Uh, they found that location was beneficial because of the proximity to the apartments in Evergreen Walk. Uh, Geisers has been in town for over 30 years. I think they deserve our support to allow apartments as part of their complex so they can be competitive with the newly approved locations at Evergreen Walk. <clears throat> I think this will be a great project for this area of South Windsor. I think it will create many new jobs. Therefore, I support the zone change request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Hi again, this is Mark Kazakowski, 863 Clark Street. Um, I want to first thank the uh, owner of uh, Geisler's for hiring a uh, superb uh, development team. Um, they got some good consultants that 
are providing a great project for the town of South Windsor, and I want to thank them for that. I want to express my support of the proposed zone change. The project was a long time in the making, and I look forward to seeing the redevelopment of the plaza come to be. The zone text was carefully crafted and thoroughly scrutinized and is a good regulation to promote mixed-use development. The rezoning will bring more housing options and the ability for our residents to age in place um, in South Windsor and provides additional affordable housing opportunities. I encourage South Windsor to continue to find opportunities to provide affordable housing that fits the character and form of our community. When communities like ours are proactive in providing affordable housing, it proves it proves we don't need top-down governance from the state telling us where, when, and how to provide housing, affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and at this point, um, I'm going to conclude the public hearing for tonight and uh, continue it to our, let's see, April 27th meeting. Um, so I'll accept the motion uh, stating such. We do have a special meeting on the 20th. Do you wanna? Um, that is already filled up. So, um, here the 27th or later will we uh, continue the public hearing on the 27th no. of april okay hey, we have a motion we have a second second okay we got a motion and a second all those in favor of the motion say aye 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 aye, aye. those opposed motion passes unanimously thank you very much mr and chairman thank you very much um Michelle, do you have anything pressing? No, I don't. Okay, then um, a motion to adjourn would be in order. I move we adjourn. Thank you. Second. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much.